Lord Winston, thank you very much indeed for agreeing to talk to Energy and Environmental Management uh, magazine. And we're going to be talking about the science of, of climate change and public understanding of and attitudes to climate change. But I, I wanted to start by asking you, when did you first become sort of intellectually convinced that climate change was happening and that human beings were the principal cause of it? You're assuming that I am intellectually convinced? I had rather assumed that, yes. Um, well, I think that's an interesting question. Um, maybe we might be better in our society not making assumptions about what people think. Um, we've never spoken together. You've never seen anything I've written, probably. Um, and I think um, that one needs to be aware that we start with a whole lot of premises of likelihood and risk. Yes. And um, at the moment, it seems almost certain that there is some degree of uh, climate change, which may be catastrophic. Um, which may be um, anthropocentric or anthropo, well, maybe man-made. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think, um, I think one of the problems with the argument is that we make assumptions about what people should believe all the time. Right. And I think that's a very serious issue. I think that's one of the reasons why there's increasing skepticism uh, at the moment about climate change and about how it's handled by, by scientists. That some scientists have perhaps been too black and white about it. I mean, by, by intellectually convinced, I meant that on the balance of probabilities, having looked at the science, you know, the the you know the sort of reasonable view, the rational view is that it is likely that climate change is happening and I that human beings that. are the main cause. Very likely. And, and you know, and I, that was my understanding of your position, mm. having mm. read some of your your, mm. your work and other interviews that you mm. you'd given. No, I think it's I think it's very likely, and I think it may well be something which has largely stemmed from the. Industrial Revolution, but equally, you know, perhaps we started climate change ourselves when we started farming eleven and a half thousand years ago. Who knows? Well, or it may be, of course, possibly. some other some other event. Yes, I've been fascinated to read <coughs> what you you said in the past about sort of the, the most important technology that human beings have ever sort of discovered and, and employed uh, is is agriculture and the huge impact that's had on how human beings organise themselves. It's the second most important. Second most after the hand axe. The hand axe, right. The hand axe is the most important technology because without the hand axe, we wouldn't have invented the other things. Yes. We wouldn't have grown the human brain because um, we wouldn't have eaten meat mm -hmm. um, and we wouldn't have had the tools wherewith we could start to make other tools. Yes. So I, th I would argue that the hand axe is more important than the laser and certainly more important than the computer. Right. But, you know, I mean, it's a, if you like, it's a conceit. It's certainly more satisfying to use an axe to chop some wood than using a computer well, in my I think experience. It, I think the point is to try and make people think. I mean, I, 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 I think that actually engaging the public is, is complex. And one of the issues is to intrigue people and I think to tell a story. I mean, humans evolutionary, in evolutionary terms like stories. Mm. Um, what they tend to turn off from is, is lectures which simply tell people as things as they are. Yes. And I think for too long scientists have done that in quite a, sometimes quite an arrogant fashion, actually. Right. Um, you know, we know best. And I don't think we do. I mean, what um, you can clearly say, uh, and I have certainly written this, that scientists are no better at predicting what's going to happen in the future than anybody else. Right. Right. And in terms of the, the, the quality of the information that the, the, the public get about, about climate change and the, the, the science and the stories that, that scientists and others try to tell about climate change, do you think that the British public is well served by how the media, press and broadcast report on well, the scientific think, developments? Well, I don't think they're badly served. And I think if you look at, I mean, I don't read a large number of foreign language newspapers. I read French ones occasionally. Um, I think we are quite well served by our journalists and I think um, there has been less and less, if you like, irrational scepticism from journalists in the last two or three years. Certainly um, the kind of things that were being published even in newspapers like The Times four or five years ago would now seem to be reprehensible yes. and laughable. So I think there has been a real effort to try and understand what is actually the most complicated issue facing us in yes. risk terms because climate change obviously involves chemistry, meteorology, physics, um, sociology, um, a whole range of how we conduct energy policy and so on. So it, it brings in a vast number of very complex things and the evidence that you're looking at of course is evidence which is often really apparently quite remote. So there are 
monstrous difficulties, I think, in getting that across. Yes. I think one of the issues that we should be discussing, if I may say so, is the very great concern I have that we are, for some reason, and I don't really understand why we're doing this, uh, probably because of the recession or because of the financial shortages, we're suddenly taking a view of stepping back a bit from public engagement in our society. Right. The research councils have cut back on the amount that they're doing. Uh, research councils, um, uh, the UK uh, um, research, the RC UK, for example, has now uh, abandoned its ambassadors um, uh, program. Yes, it's great shame. Um, there are um, such threats at universities that universities are finding it very difficult to do the sort of public engagement that they were doing. Um, it's doubtful whether the beacons for public engagement will continue because I don't think they'll be funded again. Um, and um, we have a chief scientific advisor who doesn't seem to think that public engagement is important. At least that's the impression I get from talking to him. Right. And I think that's really worrying because if we are really to understand risk, if we're really to understand mathematics, if we're really to understand science, if we're really to accept the complexities of science, mm. then above all, we need to have public engagement for two reasons. First of all, because we need to really have much more debate. But secondly, of course, why should the taxpayer pay for something which, in a difficult time, seems rather useless? Um, and so it's difficult to be persuaded that we should be paying more for the scientific research at the moment uh, than we are. And yet actually, of course, paradoxically, we probably should be spending much more on research at the moment, and that yes. should certainly include things like climate change. We've just heard from the Conservative Party conference that uh, the government are thinking of pulling back from some of the uh, things that they're doing. Yes, indeed. Um, Very worrying. With regard to uh, the carbon economy, uh, because it's going to be too costly. And um, I've no doubt that this will be reflected in other European states. And of course, if we do that in Europe, then why would the Chinese, the Indians, and all the other countries not follow suit? Yes. So I think there's a very serious failure of public engagement here. And the odd thing, of course, is that the government will be congratulated for pulling back by most people because they'll see it's alternatively that or taxation. I think, I think that may well be true, um, although we're certainly convinced that investment in the green economy uh, across the piece um, and maintaining Britain's <coughs> world class position as, an, you know, as, a, as a country that does invest and do excellent work in science and technology is, is vital for economic future as well as the sort of inherent value well, that, it, that. that it has. I mean, you say that and it sounds good, but let's look at nuclear power in Britain. Yes, I wanted so to come very, on to that. Very good example. Well, let's take it now. Nuclear fission. What's the total research budget for nuclear fission in Britain? I'm afraid I don't know the figure. 21 million figure. pounds. Right. I mean, it's like spending halfpennies. It, it's ludicrous. Um, given that this is, apart from the fact that it's a technology that we really started and in some ways perfected yes. early on, uh, we're now being hugely left behind. If we do end up with a nuclear fission program at all, we're going to have to use other people's nuclear fission. So instead of being able to sell the technology, we're going to have to buy the technology. When things go wrong, we will have to buy the expertise from outside as well. Yes. Which is the worst possible scenario at a time when we're still using 1960s technology in our nuclear power stations. Yes. Um, and there's a hugely rational view, I think, that nuclear power, not for every country, but for certain natures, certainly like ours, is almost an essential part of the portfolio. Yes, I would agree with that. And there's been some interesting research recently that actually public confidence in, in nuclear energy and the safety of nuclear energy has actually been going up steadily for the last I few decades. that's right. It hasn't been dented by incidents like well, Fukushima think, in Japan. And it comes back to your first question. I mean, I think the reason for that partly is because actually the press were extraordinarily responsible. Mm. I think it is remarkable, given that you wouldn't always say that, for example, the Daily Mail is the most scientifically responsible newspaper. I think it's remarkable that their chief um, writer in this field, Michael Hanlon, wrote such measured articles about Fukushima. And I'm sure that contributed to a very responsible position, which certainly influenced public opinion. Yes. And I think that um, Unlike almost any other European country, I mean, if you take the position of the Germans, for example, um, I mean, w we were paragons of virtue by comparison. Yes, yes, indeed. But it doesn't argue the fact 
that the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council can only afford £21 million for its research because the government's not, in, not actually investing in research we should be doing. Yes. I mean, it is very sad that the coalition government has frozen the, well, it claim, it the claim, science budget, well, it, which means it's going down in real terms. Of course. I mean, it claims it's ring fence science, but actually in, re in real terms, we're facing a 16% cut, more actually at EPSRC probably. Um, and that doesn't include the capital cut, which is 